they look at me. my story and the struggles that I've been through and the obstacles I've overcame and you know it just really put on my heart that if one person feels the same way and is at their breaking point and this video can give them just an ounce of hope and possibly save them then it's one soul saved. I have talked about clo this with close people in my life or people that were here and experienced it with me but I've never opened up and talked about how I felt through this process and what was going on in my head. I am an isolator and I know it's not always the best, but I tend to retreat inwards and try to figure things out by myself. And in this process, I learned that that's not always best. So here we go. My name is Rachel Rich. I was born and raised in Texas. Love it here. I lived in the Dallas area for a good portion of my life. And then when I graduated high school, I moved to the Houston area. In 2016, I met my husband, Matt Rich. We were very infatuated with each other, fell for each other very quickly. And it was just kind of like, one of those knock you off your feet moments. In 2018, we had our first child. We were very young, very poor. <laughs> we scraped by, but we did everything that we could for our son to give him the best life that he could possibly have and make him better than who we were. Matt and I grew up in families that weren't big on words of affirmation and love um, through speak and talk and him and I were also just not very good at that so we wanted to make break that barrier and even though it was uncomfortable for us to come out of being uncomfortable with our child so that he never went a day without knowing that there were two people on this earth that loved him more than anything and even if it was hard for us to give him that. In 2020, we got married. We had a big party. It was amazing with all of our friends and family. Um, I couldn't have asked for a better day and to be surrounded by better people. 2020, we also found out that we were pregnant with our second child. And that was an overwhelming but joyous moment. We found out on our honeymoon. <laughs> So I was so excited to go have fun and let loose. I have no kid and now I can't drink or, you know, do some things that I would do because I'm pregnant, but we still had a blast. Going back to, you know, us not being able to vocalize love. One of the ways that my husband found a way to communicate love was through music. So he would send me songs randomly through the day and it would be love songs talking about how much love there is and how amazing I am and just like speaking through other people and through music to tell me how he felt. And he did the same with our son. Every Saturday we'd, we'd wake up and make breakfast and he would turn on a song that he found and we would all dance in the living room. Just have these really special intimate moments. The end of 2020, I'm eight months pregnant, almost nine months pregnant. And we were very young when we had our first son. So as we're growing, we're maturing our relationship with each other. We're, you know, have higher goals for ourselves, you know, don't want to live paycheck to paycheck. We're working hard to achieve things. And one of the things that he decided that he wanted to do was you know, stop drinking and stop going out, eating better. Like this man had never had broccoli in his life and he was trying to eat it and just be a better person and better health and like be here. And one of the 
striving aspects of that was he was having panic attacks. When I say panic attacks, I mean crippling anxiety where my husband is in the shower in the fetal position weeping and I'm crawling in there eight months pregnant holding him and holding him in our room while our son is in the other room playing and trying to be his rock during this time and the reason for the panic attacks was he just had this overwhelming feeling that he was gonna die young and leave his kids and he just kept repeating that and I tried to joke and laugh and be there for him and say you know we're gonna annoy each other forever we've made it this long we've been through all of this like there's not a day that's gonna go by that I'm not gonna be here for you to roll your eyes at so I don't know why you're trying to you know bounce but we're gonna be in this forever and he slowly started to get better um, and, and I attributed it to us taking on another child, you know, people who have children know that children are a blessing, but also a drastic responsibility. So going from one to two is a lot and it can be a lot. So I kind of attributed it to that and tried to be his peace through it. In 2021, our second child came into the world like a rocket and to this day she's just Still a rocket. She is a force of nature. And I had a C-section for both kids. We decided in February, this was six weeks after our daughter was born, that we were going to try to go out and hang out with people. So we went to a birthday party. This was the first time that I had been out and about walking around after my C-section. And our daughter had been out of our apartment to experience the world for an elongated period of time. So we came home and he wanted to go hang out with friends and I just wasn't feeling it. And I wasn't one of those wives that ever really told him no or would care if he went and hung out with his friends. Like go have fun, decompress, come back to me, you know. But this night I just didn't want it and I, I couldn't understand why I was like no like you're in our only vehicle it has the car seats like what if I need to take Linux to the hospital or our son and I just really didn't want him to go he told me it was gonna be okay he would be back in a little bit and I said okay and he left and that was the last time I saw his face So I ended up calling him that night and I was upset and was like, can you please come home? I just, I want you to come home. And he said, I'll be home by this time. Well, I ended up falling asleep with the kids and I woke up on the dot at that time, not a second more or after, and he wasn't home. And I had already called him and was upset and frustrated earlier in the night. So I didn't want to be that wife that was just calling over and over again, like, where are you at? What are you doing? So I let it go. 10 minutes rolls by, 20 minutes rolls by, 30 minutes rolls by. And now I'm fuming and I'm calling him and I'm leaving voicemails. I'm trying to feed our baby and he's not answering. And I, I said some, probably not nice things. Um, and I went back to sleep and our children woke up the next morning and I'm getting them ready. I'm still struggling because I had had a C-section. So anyone that's ever gone through that knows that the recovery is not easy. And I get a knock at my door. Well, we live in apartments and it's weird that I have a knock on my door this early in the morning and I don't have mad there so I'm a little skeptical and I look out the peephole and I see two men and I don't want to answer the door like stranger danger but something inside of me tells me to so I open the door and it's two officers and they ask me if they can come in and speak to me so they do they ask me if I'm the owner of the make and model of our car and I say yes and they ask me if I know Matthew Rich and I say yes he's my husband and they're standing in the kitchen and there's an island between us and then our couches are in the living room and I've got laundry piled on the couch um, my house is a disaster and they tell me that he was in an accident and I immediately lose my breath 
and ask if he's okay like where is he at can I go see him like I'm sitting here thinking I don't have the car seats how do I get these babies to go see their daddy like who do I call can I can't ride in the car with Lennox without a car seat because she's six weeks old and in the, all of these thoughts they look at me and they say I'm sorry ma'am he didn't he didn't make it and when those words left their mouth the whole world went black and I felt like I couldn't breathe luckily I was by the couch and I just fell back and sat down and I sat there for a few minutes just trying to regain focus of what just happened and in my mind it's like there's no way this didn't just happen this there's no way this happened what is going on and Lennox starts crying my baby and I go in there to get her and I come out with this little baby and I see the police officer's eyes and like the pain that they felt for me and I put her in a swing and I'm hysterical at this point and they tell me that they're not gonna leave me until I get someone over there. So I call my mother who lives about five minutes away at the time. She can't understand what I'm saying. She gets in the car immediately and comes to me. And she comes in the house and she sees the two police officers and she asks them what's going on. And she asks me, where's Matt? And I can't talk. The police officers tell her. She can't believe it and she's crying for me. And they left. I ended up calling my best friend and she couldn't understand me. She thought we had gotten in a fight and so she's driving to me. And this is very early in the morning. I had to call his parents. And tell them that they, they left, just lost their child this child that they had loved and invested in and watch grow up and watch have his own children that he was gone and I sat there and heard them drop to their knees and wail in pain and scream For about a year after, I didn't sleep very well because I would wake up from nightmares over and over and over of hearing those screams again. And you could just feel the pain through the phone. They all got in the car and drove to me. My dad got in the car and drove to me. Sister got on the plane and came to me. And I remember going into our bedroom while well, my mom and my friend are in the living room trying to figure out, you know, process what just happened. And I'm laying in the dark in our bed his clothes are on the bed his things are on his nightstand his pillow smells like him and I'm laying in the dark facing the closet and all I could think about was all you have to do is go into the closet and get the gun and it's all over with. You could end this. You, you won't have to feel this pain. You won't have to go through this process. You won't have to do any of this. All you have to do is get the courage to go get the gun. And I don't know how long I sat there. I don't know what happened outside of the room, what process, like all I could think about was that. My dad got to the house, the apartment, and asked where I was and he walked into the bedroom and saw me laying there facing the closet in silence. 
he walked into the closet and grabbed the gun and walked right out. And I don't think he knows this, but he probably saved me that day. They packed me and my kids up and got everything that we needed for a newborn baby. And they took me to my mom's house and then proceeded to grieve and feel together for the next few weeks or on the next week they packed up my entire apartment, our life into boxes. I went back once there with them because they had questions about what is this? Is this important? Do we need to keep it? And I went and answered them and I left and I never went back. I'm a person that doesn't like to show weakness. I don't like to show my emotion. And I think that that makes me stronger, but it doesn't. I tried to make it through alone. I would be in a group and I would feel a rush of pain and I would go into a room and wail in pain and cry. And then I would come out with my tears wiped and act like I didn't just lose myself. I had to get his work truck back to his company. I had to find a place to bury my husband. I had to get the funeral arrangements. I had to pick what he was gonna wear. I had to call credit card companies, the social security office, our bank, anything that had his name on it and tell them that he was gone and just hear the sympathy and pity in their voice over and over again and just have to relive that moment. Yes, I'm calling because my husband died and just those words over and over and over. I would say for the first two to three weeks, I wanted nothing to do with my kids because all they did was remind me of him and their mannerisms and their facial expressions and their likes and dislikes. And I was lucky to have friends and family that would help me support them and take care of them. And they were always with me. I just, I couldn't do it. I grew up in church. And, you know, I had relationships with God and all that stuff. And as I got, became an adult and went on my own, um, I kind of lost and had that separation. And Matt were, and I were um, going to church again and starting to kind of, you know, dip our toe in the water and feel that. And I remember being in the parking lot at the funeral home and walking away from everyone. It's a very large parking lot and just screaming with hatred towards God. And my main dispute was, you know, as a mother, I'll take a hit all day long for my kids. I'll burn the world down for every last breath of theirs. You can do whatever you need to do to me as long as they're okay. And I couldn't understand how it was fair for them to be robbed like that. To be robbed of father-daughter dances and throwing a football, learning how to drive, calling your dad when you're in trouble. You know, I, I couldn't understand how it was fair to do that to such little babies and why that burden had to be put on their shoulders. We weren't bad people. How could that happen to us? How could that happen to them? And I just, I hated him. I spent a good amount of time trying to fill the hole inside of me with things in the world, alcohol, bad habits. I wasn't eating. I lost an unmeasurable amount of weight. You could see my ribs. I was basically killing myself slowly. It wasn't healthy at all. And it was a process that I had to go through. And I blamed everyone. I blamed myself. I kept 
thinking, how would my life be different if in that moment that I woke up, had I called him? After the coroner's report came back and the death report came back, he died after that moment. He died probably 20, 30 minutes after I woke up. And how would it have been different if I had called? How would my life be different if I had threw a fit and told him he wasn't allowed to go out? How my children would have what they needed? So I would say for the next year of my life, my heart was filled with hate. I was confused and I was alone. I had in that process built a house and my mom didn't want me to move into it because she was scared and she saw that side of me. Um, but I left with my two young kids and I decided to get a change and move on to this next chapter of my life. And I put this forefront on for everyone to see. I was very lucky to have Matt's family there as support. There were several times that I would call his mom and just say I can't do this and she would come over and I would be in my room in the dark, laying there, not moving, and she would come in and make sure that I was okay, and then she would stay there and take care of my kids. I did get little glimpse of light through all of this. Um, as I said earlier, you know, my husband talked to me through music, and whether you believe in supernatural things or not, um, I definitely had my experiences that threw me off my feet. There were moments where I was sitting by myself asking questions like why God or talking to Matthew and out of nowhere music would turn on whether it's my phone or in the car or if I'm in a store the song changes <laughs> and it was answering me in that moment. I mean you can imagine sitting in your car crying, asking why, why do I feel this way? Why did this happen? Are you okay, Matt? Like, are you feeling fine? Like, what is going on through your head? And the song coming on out of nowhere, you not pushing anything, a song about flying free and my soul is with Jesus now. And it, it was crazy. And it kept happening over and over. And I would have these dreams about him where I felt like I could reach out and touch him. And, you know, little things or big things would happen to me and my family to benefit us. That I didn't pray for, I didn't ask for. It was just kind of like blessings. I had random people that I had never met before in my life come up to me and at the grocery store, out and about with my kids. And they would say things to me like, God has heard your tears and he, he weeps with you and he promises you that you will never feel this again. And I just kept saying, why? Why did I have to feel this in the first place? The promise isn't really a promise when you've already felt it, you know? It's like, oh, I promise I'm not gonna cheat again but you already cheated in the first place. The damage is done. There's no coming back. And I, I couldn't understand. And people coming to me saying, you know, your life is at a fork in the road. And which way that you go determines where you end up. And it was just so strange to me. Like people that didn't even know my name, didn't know what I went through just coming up to me and speaking these things to me. I spent the year after that still trying to fulfill my things like people and alcohol. It, well, alcohol wasn't as bad. I was definitely waning off because I was alone now and I didn't want to not be able to take care of my kids if they needed something from me. And I formed relationships that in the long run, were probably not the best for me, but in the moment, they felt like a relief. If I could put, take my burden off and put it on them for that time being. And 
those people I outgrew and you know separated myself from and my circle became smaller and smaller I could start to see the light at the end of the tunnel and my heart was softening to the world to my children and waking up each day was better and I've met some some really amazing people that are kind and gentle and letting me experience love and things like that and I still try to have those memories with my kids that he would want me to have uh, I mean, going to Colorado with them where we went our honeymoon to and know doing the things that he would want us to do and raising them the way he would want me to raise them and you know just giving them the absolute best and giving them every ounce of me even when I barely have anything to give giving more than I have and it's you know it's not easy I feel like I got the worst of both worlds you know watching your child that did know their dad grieve and want to sit in a room by themselves in the dark in pain and come to you asking questions like why did this happen where is he at why is he not coming back and having to explain that to a child's mind has not been easy but then on the other hand I have a child that never got to truly meet him and understand who their dad was and how he would make us laugh and <laughs> how you know amazing he truly was and I feel like she was robbed you know for the past few months I've been having this like private journey of finding myself and you know coming closer to God and I've slowly learned that I can't do this alone no matter how much I try to no matter how much I try to control the situation and I try hard I can't the harder I fight the more I lose I have learned to or started to try to learn to breathe in the moment and to just step away and I you know I still have flashbacks of him and you know driving by a place that we went through and that memory and you know feeling sorrow for a moment in time and you know having to snap back into where I'm at and and one of the things you know I've had to learn is everybody has a choice and ev everything has consequences and in the choices we made this was what happened and it was a drastic thing but it happened God sometimes does allow things that you can't handle happen to you and in those moments you lean into him and you look for him and it took me almost three years to achieve that not even achieve it because I still struggle with it every day but to understand it and embrace it I just need to wake up every day and love everyone around me my kids my co-workers my friends people I don't know and give so much love that at some point the question is what does she have that I don't have why is she so loving after everything that she's been through why is she so positive even when there's moments that you don't want to be positive and it's because of God it's finding him someone whose love doesn't make sense we as humans are so wrapped up in thinking that love is earned and if you are this way and do these things you gain love but that's circumstantial it's not real love like real love is a choice a choice to wake up every day and love someone through their faults and their fears and their missteps and even when it doesn't make sense like it 
you don't understand why this love exists they love and that's how god loves all of us he chooses to love us through it all and so passionately and so gentle and so fierce and it is the most fulfilling thing that i could have ever asked for it's there when i don't need it it's there when i'm drowning and i'm begging for it and it has been just waiting for me patiently and coming out in its moments and looking for me and just reminding me that it's there but letting it come to me because you're truly not going to make the choice until you want to make the choice i'm still struggle i still have bad moments i still have loneliness i still have regret and that doesn't go away overnight no matter what circumstance you're in whether you've lost someone whether you're going through things in life no matter you think you're at your lowest point it doesn't go away overnight you're not gonna gain the satisfaction from obtaining more. You're not gonna gain this fulfillment by suppressing your emotions with things like alcohol or drugs or things like that. You're not gonna fill this hole with the love of someone else. You're gonna fill it yourself. And you can you fill it with God. One of the things that I would like to know anybody that's ever gone through this loss or any type of loss. I feel like you don't necessarily ever move on, but you learn to move forward. And that there will be days where the sun shines and you feel it on your skin and you, you know, the world feels right and the moment feels right. And then there will be days like it's too much and it takes a long time to balance those out and I'm three years in and I still have the low days but there is hope when my husband left this earth he took a part of me with him but he also left pieces behind for me to find and I act up all of his things and try to bottle up these emotions for so long and keep them to myself instead of embracing the joy that we had together and the memories and the two beautiful children that he left for me to love and to find him all over again through them. And who knows if I'll ever feel that again for someone else but at least for right now I get to experience that one in a lifetime kind of love through my two beautiful babies. There were so many moments where I would just imagine him next to me you know me thinking this is impossible how can I do this and him grabbing my face saying Rachel you've got to get up you've got to do this you have to be there for our babies you have to see this through you gotta be strong in these last three years i have met the most broken version of myself but i have also met the strongest version of myself and people ask me i don't know how you did it how are you so strong you're amazing and my answer is i didn't really have a choice there isn't a single thing in this world i would do or i wouldn't do for my children this is all for them. They were my choice and I gotta see that through until the end. Life is hard and it throws things at you that you never thought that you could take on, but you can. You just have to believe and know that God is with you through everything. He's the calm in the storm, the peace to sleep on a ship in a hurricane and he will never leave. I, as I said, made this video, I just, I've had this put on my heart and I've really felt it for a couple months now and I know that the world can be hard and not forgiving and can just take a beating and beat on you every single day. But even if this video reaches one person and lets them know that 
it's gonna be okay and that there is something out there that loves you through it all and all you have to go is look for it it's one person it's one soul saint and one is more than enough so I hope this was helpful <laughs> and I appreciate you listening if you've made it this far <laughs> and I love you